this is all on my website under an article about 24 men that I interviewed with inattentive ADHD. But their profile and the emotions they had, the feelings of rejection, the shame, anger, depression, yeah, all the same as the women. The fact of not getting diagnosed contributes to a lot of these problems. And people will say, Having ADHD isn't the problem. Not knowing I had it was the problem. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD. And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 231 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Look, if you've been listening for a while, I bet you're starting to see your strengths and dare I say brilliance. So can you imagine what working with me would be like? Look, we love the sparkly and new, so sometimes it can feel like we're all over the place. ADHD women often tell me, I am interested in so much. Which of my many interests is the one that I should actually pursue? Well, we have interest-driven brains, right? And hyperfocus. So if we can learn more about who we really are and what's truly important to us, we'll know exactly what we should be hyperfocusing on, and then the sky's the limit. That's exactly what we do in my six-week program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. -okay. It includes live coaching with me and a private community of women just like you. And guess what? It's open now. We have two cohorts that are still open for this year. And if you go to the website right now, you'll see the price is $1,194. But I don't want you to buy it at that price. If you're thinking about it at all, Please take advantage of the promotion and get $500 off, but don't wait because things are filling up. You can find out more at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-OK, -okay. and don't forget to use the code PODCASTSASS, that's S-A-S-S, -S -S, to get $500 off the program just for being a podcast listener. I would love to have you join us. So now let's get on to our regular programming. You know, right, that my purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. And in the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something. Not one. So for this and many other reasons, I am just delighted to introduce you to Cynthia Hammer. Cynthia Hammer has a master's degree in social work and was diagnosed with inattentive ADHD in 1992, when she was 49 years old. A few years after her diagnosis, she founded and led the nonprofit ADD Resources. The mission of that organization, based in Tacoma, Washington, was to educate adults around ADHD. This organization grew to 800 members, produced a monthly newsletter, and hosted an annual conference with national ADHD authorities, such as 
Drs. Hallowell, Rady, Dodson, and Brown as presenters. During COVID isolation, Cynthia wrote a memoir called Living with Inattentive ADHD. While writing her book, Cynthia learned to her dismay that children and adults with inattentive ADHD continue to be underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Learning this motivated her to start a new nonprofit, the Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Her mission was that children with inattentive ADHD be diagnosed by age eight and adults with inattentive ADHD be correctly diagnosed when they seek help. Cynthia and her husband, Steve, have been married for 54 years and have three sons and four grandchildren. Welcome, Cynthia. Did I get all of that right? Nothing was wrong. It's all true. (laughs) Well, I just want to say before we start, I am honored to have you join us. You are truly the grand dom of ADHD. (laughs) So before we go into your book, your nonprofit and inattentive ADHD, can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? Sure. What were the circumstances around your diagnoses? I mean, you told us that you weren't diagnosed until you were 49. Can you explain? In 1992, I think we knew then that maybe children had the hyperactive type of ADHD. There was some literature about the inattentive type. And I would read that because we had concerns about my middle son. He was going to a public school and he wasn't doing very, very well. And it was time to move on to what we called junior high then, but it was really like middle school. And we just knew he'd be lost there, traveling the halls and not finding his classroom, not remembering his assignment. So we sent him to a small private school And meanwhile, I was reading about inattentive ADHD and like the symptoms, they're they're confusing. Sometimes it would sound like him and sometimes it wouldn't. And we went back and forth for a couple of years. And finally, my husband heard a presentation by a pediatrician in town and he came home and said, I think we should have him evaluated. So this pediatrician, I'll call him Dr. Smith, we I took my son and we started going for Uh, weekly appoint, no, monthly appointments, because I think it's still true. You need to get a monthly appointment to get your prescription for the Ritalin or whatever medication you're taking. And meanwhile, I had a job as a social, I was a geriatric social worker. So I worked at a continuing care retirement community. We had a supervisor who said she would give staff evaluations, but they weren't happening. And when they finally did happen, she said to me, you're hard to evaluate because you do some things well and other things are problematic. And that just rang a bell for me because I had been thinking off and on, it's, I think I might have ADHD, but, you know, you just put it to the side. You just keep moving on. And when she said that, I stopped and said, I think so, too. And when I went back to Dr. Smith for my next son's appointment, I said to Dr. Smith, I think I have ADHD. And he responded, you do. (laughs) I'm actually impressed by Dr. Smith because adults weren't even in the DSM until 1994. And so, yeah, I ended up being very thankful I mean, after being crushed that I had ADHD, I was thankful to know that he diagnosed me and he was willing to treat me because he was a pediatrician. But on the downside, I thought for the longest time, not a long time, but like six months, that I was the only adult that knew they had ADHD. I was the only adult in the U.S. But then I found the book by Lynn Weiss, ADHD in Adults. And in the back of the book, they mentioned Lisa Post, who lived in Bellingham. So when I called her, there were two of us. And she told me about the first conference that was being held in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which I went to. And Dr. Hallowell was there. Terry Matlin was there. Sari Solden was there. (laughs) We they were all youngsters, you know. Yeah, but they were in their 30s, you know. 
And it was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience, even though there were so many things about how it was set up that we were all struggling to find our room, not to lose our keys, to find where we're supposed to go to the <laughs> sessions, because no one organizing the conference knew about the things they needed to know to help people with ADD. And we were saying that the things that would have helped us would help everyone. Yeah. And so years later, and I write about this in my book, that I was kind of upset that Dr. Smith thought I had ADHD, but he never told me. He observed me for like 15 minutes, once a month for two years, and he could tell I had, or he was comfortable saying I had ADHD, but he never mentioned it. And I feel that's wrong. It minimizes the seriousness of the disorder if someone I said, if someone observed cancer, well, I read this from Dear Abby, <laughs> that someone wrote this question. As I was at the opera and I noticed some growth on a woman's neck. And because I'm an oncologist, I worried it was cancer. Should I have said something to her? And Dear Abby said, yes. And so I feel the same way that some of these therapists or the, they were, they think they see, have a patient or a client that they think has ADHD, but they're reluctant to bring it up. I just think that's wrong because it's kind of life-threatening. I said, it's not life-threatening like you're going to die, mm -hmm. but you're not going to achieve your full life if you don't know you yeah. have this diagnosis. You're always going to wonder, right? Like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? And we can't change anything if we don't know why, right? Right, right. And so... I just think he should have told me. <laughs> so once you knew it was ADHD and you had the benefit of hindsight, what are some of the symptoms that you always wondered about? But then, you know, once you knew it was ADHD, you were like, oh, my gosh, that was clearly my ADHD. Well, I think mostly my car accidents and my poor driving. Well, another thing with my children, I was having some problem with their behavior. So we went to a therapist and he set us up, told me about behavior modification. I went home and created a beautiful program and with plus points and minus points. And so we were tracking it and maybe for a week behavior was improving. And then one morning I woke up and forgot about it. And I never even thought about it again, just went totally out of my mind. So things like that would be hurt, you know, your your memory and your loss of things because you don't see it visually and it doesn't remind you. Not having clothes ready to go to meetings and rushing downstairs to fix something or to iron something and being late for things, those kinds of things. I don't frankly remember going back to reflect a lot and say, oh, that explains it, that explains it, that explains it. I think that initially I was just, I guess, crestfallen, a bit devastated, really. I was shame-based. I felt I used to think I was like Hester Prynne in The Scarlet Letter, and she had an A for adultery. I had ADHD. Well, I think it was a really different time to be diagnosed in, right? Yeah, I guess I wouldn't. I mean, it's so freeing now to hear that people in some circumstances, and I encourage people if they're in a circumstance to speak up that they have ADHD, that, you know, it's so shame-based. You didn't want to tell anyone. Absolutely. So, Cynthia, you are such an inspiration to me personally. You know, I read your book. Mm -hmm. I loved it. It was fun. And... I have friends who've done really well financially, and they're talking about retiring. And I'm like, what? I can't retire ever. And so the fact that you've taken this write-a-book challenge on at 80 that has nearly killed me, I'm telling you, you're my role model. I want to grow up and be just like you. <laughs> and so first, I want to know, what age do you feel? Oh, I feel younger than I guess I think how an 80 year, year old would feel. I feel younger than that. So how old? Like how old do you feel? Because I always say 
I feel like I've never aged beyond 35. I'm just always perpetually going to be 35. And so I'm wondering, is that true? <laughs> is that how you feel or no? Uh, I don't give any thought to it, Tracy. Sorry. I, really I think that's the key. Oh, I see. Yeah, you just keep moving on. But curiously, I think when we find our passion, it's so energizing. I don't feel tired. And the other day we interviewed Terry Matlin and she said she's going to do be doing what she's doing for the rest of her life. You know, she just has that commitment, that satisfaction from what she's doing. And it sounds like you're saying the same thing. Yeah, probably just in a different way. So why did you decide to write this book now? Or, or you know, during COVID, basically. Well, I didn't start out deciding to write this book. I decided... I had gotten a memoir from a friend who had moved to Australia, and she wrote about her life. And I thought, well, I'm going to be isolated for COVID. I might as well write uh, something for my children. Because although our family, we didn't talk a lot about our histories. You know, my children didn't know a lot about how I grew up. We lived on the West Coast. My parents lived on the East Coast. We got together for family vacations. But I don't think they really knew a lot about my, and, and maybe they wouldn't be interested. But I thought at some point, if I write it down and they are interested, it's there for them to read. So I wrote this 60,000 word essay and I had a few people read it because as I wrote it, I was thinking, this is pretty good. And then I read that you can have your friends tell you that your book is interesting, but you really need a more professional opinion. So <laughs> I went online and found someone who I was learning these terms, you know, all the different kind of editors there are, but I got a developmental editor who did like everything. And it cost as much as a college class to have him get involved in helping me with the book. It was really a good experience because the first thing he did out of my 60,000 words, he took 20,000 of them away not because they were bad words, but he said, we're going to make this about your ADHD journey. And so the things that aren't about that, we're not going to include in the book and that it's going to be the hero's journey. So yeah. it's focused on, you know, what you're saying, how you improve, how you had problems and more and more problems. And then you get diagnosed and then slowly things get better. And so that's what he did. And he had additional questions that drew out more material from me, certain things I had briefly mentioned, but they were very difficult for me to write. I was in tears trying to write it, and he understood that, but he said it's important to get it down there. And then he, the hardest, not that that was the hardest, but the other thing was he wanted to put things in chronological order. And if you know the ADHD brain, I mean, I was struggling to say, now, how old were my children then? And then I had to figure out how old would I have been and what year was that? I mean, and that I was like such tedious work. And if I, I made some of it up, I just, even now, if you ask me what years I ran the ADD resources, although I've learned it several times off the top of my head, I just don't know those dates. So that was the frustrating part of it. I can relate. So I'm curious. So you wrote this book and originally it was a memoir, but then you decided, okay, this is going to be about my ADHD journey. Yes. When did publishers get involved? How did that happen? And who who is your publisher, by the way? Uh, it's Hatherlay Press and they distribute through Penguin Random House. Okay, so no. Penguin. Congratulations. So how did that come about? Did well, you write the book proposal and then, you know... Yes. You did yes. all of that. Yeah, it's yes. a lot of work. And the, <laughs> and the developmental editor to help me with that, um, what to say and all. And I, uh, there were a couple of websites that were really helpful. Readsy and Pro Writing, they gave a lot... I kept improving my writing because I was taking these free classes and these three programs that helped with editing. They Grammarly wasn't at that level yet, but these other places were. I was learning about not the passive voice and not 
putting in really and show, just and so and all those filler words, learning the length of the sentences, just a lot. I used to write articles when I ran the nonprofit back, you know, when I first started ADD Resources, we put out a newsletter and I ran artic- wrote articles then, but now I was learning more about the craft of writing. So it was great during COVID because before we, you had to make copies of everything, make copies of a few chapters of your book, send yep. it out. You could do it all online. And so I, again, through resources, found out who were the agents that wanted memoir, who were the agents that wanted self-help, and emailed it to like 50 people. And just on the day I was about ready to say, I guess I'll (laughs) self-publish, I got a phone call. I've never met these people. I've never even had a Zoom call with them. I only know their name is Ryan and Ryan and Andrew. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and I signed a contract with them in November of 21, never thinking it would be almost two years before my book was published. But what happened in the meantime, because I started the nonprofit, in the meantime, part of my motivation was, well, I need a platform if I have a book. And so I was thinking yeah. that the nonprofit could be my platform and the profits, any money from the book is going to go to the nonprofit. I mean, that dollar twenty-seven better add up. <laughs> <laughs> so the book is coming out. What, what did you tell me in July? Uh, I told them at one point I was embarrassed to tell people because it keeps changing. (laughs) Publishing. Yeah. But now now they tell me I I should be safe if I say it's out in July and it's available now for pre-order. Wonderful. Wonderful. And we're going to give all of those links and they'll also be in the show notes. One more thing I wanted to say, though. Yeah. And in spite of all the downside of having, well, what happened? So when I started the nonprofit, I kept blogging. And every now and then I'd write articles for Medium. And and some of it I thought was really worthwhile to add to the book. So over the past year, the book has grown back to now it's 55,000 words. And it's gotten newer material in it that I wrote since I first submitted the book. Yeah. Uh, But um, the thing that came from the publisher is Dr. Halliwell only wants to write a blurb for your book if you have published, if you have a publisher, not if you self-publish. And so, and over the intervening years, I befriended Dr. Ferrone. I befriended Dr. Rakish Yarn. I was in communication with Dr. Dodson. I knew him from before. So all these people read my book and wrote reviews. And and that is what I keep reminding myself is I never would have gotten that. And that has opened a lot of doors to me, the fact that I do have those positive reviews from those people. Well, you're part of the old guard, right? I mean, you're you're the grand dom of ADHD, <laughs> certainly in a ten of ADHD. Well, that's what Carrie Matlin. I mean, there's a lo- quite a few of us that I got got started at the very beginning, and we're yeah. we're leaving, and she's worried about who's picking things up. But I'm going to have to tell her that you're here. Oh, I love Terry Matlin. I just think she's absolutely lovely. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I think what's happening is I'm noticing that all the people that you really like, I really like too. So, <laughs> uh, it's interesting. Okay, so what do you hope, Cynthia, to accomplish with your book? Well, <laughs> if I, I'm learning to dream, and mm. my dream is that it become a really big seller because by becoming a big seller people are going to pay attention to inattentive ADHD. And I think by reading my book, 
I didn't have, I, I think I have dysgraphia and maybe mm-hmm. a bit of auditory processing disorder, but I always said I had a simple case of ADHD, but it was bad enough. And so I, you know, people were going to look, I had an intact family. I had financial resources. I I didn't get involved in drugs. I didn't, I went to college. I went to graduate school. So, you know, I can't say that there was, you can't say, well, it's because of this, she had problems or because of that, she had problems. If they looked at my history, the, the only thing that caused me the problems was my undiagnosed inattentive ADHD. Yeah. Yeah, no, I hear you. And the thing is, we were both privileged, right? So I always wonder and worry about those women and men and children, of course, that didn't have the resources that we had, you know, and trauma and all of that. And it's, I worry about that. And so at least we can offer this resource that doesn't cost anything, right? Yes. Okay. So I want to tell you a little story. And it's so weird that literally this just happened two days ago. So I was talking to a woman I've known for several years. And of course, I asked about her two girls who are in college. And then I asked, well, how is your son doing who's in high school? And she said not very well, but because she speaks primarily Spanish and my Spanish is so bad. (laughs) We were, uh, who am I kidding? My Spanish is non-existent. We were having some communication problems, but thankfully, a really good friend of mine was staying with us, and she's from Mexico. She had come to celebrate Mother's Day with us. Her college-age sons live up here, and because she's fluent in Spanish, I asked her to translate, and this is what I learned. So apparently, this woman's son was doing okay in school, and you know, if you're not flunking, no one really cares that you're not living to your potential. But she knew there was clearly something going on. And so she had him visit the school psychologist, but they said, nah, it's nothing. (laughs) But clearly this mom, like her instinct, right? She was worried and she thought they were wrong. And so she was telling us that her son didn't like school. He was bored, wasn't interested, but he wasn't a troublemaker. He was shy and quiet, kind of sat in the back of the classroom. He was in his head a lot. He kept to himself but he could be really hard on himself and he seemed disconnected, but he had real interests and his interests happened to be snakes, reptiles, venom (laughs) and video games. And so I asked her, you know, what's his eye contact like? She said he makes good eye contact. He seems to understand social rules pretty well, but she knew there was something because she could just tell and he was definitely not living to his potential. And of course, I'm not a doctor, but the first thing I thought of, because I was reading your book, especially, was inattentive ADHD. We know it's missed a lot in girls, but I also think it's missed a lot in boys because schools and clinicians look for the troublemakers. So if you have a child who's shy and keeps to themselves, no one thinks, hey, maybe that child is struggling because of inattentive ADHD. And so Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, can you speak to the challenges in helping parents, school personnel, and clinicians recognize children with possible inattentive ADHD? Like, what are the symptoms? What do you look for? That's interesting you bring it up because that is one of our focuses. And I'm in the process of trying to write a course that we could give to special education teachers to help them help their teachers in their schools learn to identify the children with inattentive ADHD because I'm tired of hearing they're not recognized because they're not disruptive. I think partially they're not recognized because people don't know what to look for. Totally. And so there's lots of things that people can look for. And as we've been interviewing different professionals like Terry Matlin and Kathleen Nadeau and Brenda and Mahan, we're asking them, how could you have been identified as children? Or how do you think children with, and they, so many small behaviors. They're saying like, if the child is only not putting, consistently not putting the name on the paper, or they're not answering the questions on the back side of the page, or they're always having to ask a classmate where they are. When the teacher calls on them, they're not aware of, where the class is, you know, they've been dreaming, they're off Mm -hmm. in space, they're losing things. If they came home from school and you talked with them, 
you could notice that they don't have a large social circle. They might have one or two friends. They enjoy, uh, they're more introverted. They might enjoy reading a lot. They uh, Like children with ADHD, they might excel in certain topics, and then you wonder why they're not excelling in everything. There used to be a video online of a woman videoed her daughter, and you yeah. It was these two children, and you could just visually see the difference. One girl just was, it was hard for her to talk smoothly. She looked very shy, withdrawn. And our organization is going to start counting on the elementary schools to recognize these children because for several reasons. It's the, they get to see the child for many hours a day in a structured setting. Mm -hmm. And they get to see the child in contrast to the other children in the classroom. So they know what normal child development is, and they can see that maybe this is a little bit off the end of the chart. And what I like the wording is they talk about children that have spiky personalities. So they're really good at some things and not at others. And we're just going to start. And the other reason we think that the teachers are so important and, and the parent you talk about was extra smart because she already had two children. So she knew she could help know that this child wasn't quite as good or not was different yes. than the other two. And she was concerned about it. But many parents, it might be their first girl or it might be their only child. And so they don't have a good way to, to compare. But a teacher or elementary school personnel do. And the concern is... They're saying, well, girls show up when they get to middle school because everything gets harder. But the problem is by then, they don't have teachers that are spending much time with them. Yeah. Yeah. And we know with neuroplasticity, there is so much that we can do if we catch it early enough, right? Yes. Early start is really, really key. So let me ask you, in your book, I noticed that you talk a lot about slow processing speed. And I am wondering, number one, if you could tell us what you mean by that. And number two, is that a symptom of inattentive ADHD? It's something I experience. And <laughs> this is complicated, but there are lots more and more, especially women I've seen with inattentive ADHD who are also saying they have autism. Now, I don't think I have autism, but some of my behaviors could be a little bit on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. And maybe the slow processing speed is more in that direction. But it's like, I think it's very hard that we've been putting people into these silos and saying, you're this way, because I have impulsivity. And yet the inattentive type, as it's described, isn't typically impulsive. That's more with the hyperactive impulsive. Yes. Years ago, someone said to me, it's like we have ADD, it's a pack of cards and you throw the cards on the ground and you get those cards and I get those, you know, we get different cards, but it's all from the same pack. And so we all present it differently. So my slow processing speed, I say it because my eyes would see something, but then my brain didn't register it. Like, yes, I noticed that the garage door was shut, but then I got in the car and backed into the garage door. So how did that happen? I saw that the car was parked there. Why did I back my car up into the car that I just saw was there? Yeah, no, it, it makes perfect sense. So I, I, maybe some of your listeners will respond to that and some will say, I don't know, what that's bizarre. <laughs> well, I've just noticed that there are some people with ADHD, women, because, you know, that's who I work with, who talk about slow processing speed. And then there are others who have really, really fast processing speed. And typically what I've seen is those are the really hyperactive women. Right. Versus the more inattentive women tend to complain more about slow processing speed. And so as I was reading your book, you know, I, I wasn't really making the distinction, but then I'm reading your book and I'm thinking, maybe that's it. Yeah, because Dr. Barkley, he termed slow cognitive tempo. Something. 
he was trying to create a total new silo, saying it's different from inattentive, but that sluggishness sometimes could be how people with inattentive ADHD feel. You know, ah. they a little bit of sluggishness. That's so interesting. And that led to my next question, which you kind of alluded to. I was really curious about you because as I read your story, I'm thinking she sounds like there's hyperactivity impulsivity. I mean, you're jumping down flights of stairs and breaking your leg. You're stealing the family car with a driver's license. You're extreme <laughs> zip lining in Costa Rica. How old were you when you did that? 67. I love you. You're almost dying when you're sailboarding. I mean, you're a, you're a hellion. <laughs> so I was like, where, like, why not combined type versus inattentive type? Hmm. And do you think it's the slow processing speed? Yeah, I guess I always look on the hyperactive type like you being coming across as really high energy, uh, very, um, voluble, I don't know the right word, but fluent in your language. You know, you, you're, the words are right there for you. You can talk easily and quickly. Um, and I think of that coming across as a, with a lot of dynamism and love of life. You know, they're just big characters, the people that have hyperactivity. That's how I look at hyperactivity. And for myself, I don't see myself that way. I am a risk taker. I like Risk taking. I like physical activity, and I think some people look on that they might have been more the combined as children, and then they mellowed out as they yes. got older. I don't have a good enough memory to say that was true of me or not. Yeah, and and I think what you say is so true. I mean, you use the term silo, and I'm assuming that is synonymous with labels, right? We want to label everything. And right. the deeper I get into ADHD, the more I am convinced that ADHD, anxiety, depression, autism, you know, bipolar, all of those things are kind of different versions of kind of just the same different brain. And as they say, you meet one person with ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD, right? We are all so different. And so I don't know, the more, the more I get into this, the more I'm thinking, what is this with all these labels? Like we need to label everything. Well, if you're active on LinkedIn, in the UK and in Australia, they're much more talking about neurodivergence and the need for neurodiversity. Uh, Okay, they talk that we're all neurodiverse because everyone's brain is unique as their fingerprints. Yep. But there's some of us that are even more different and we're mm -hmm. neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. And in the US, we don't talk about neurodivergence too much. And I think it's because we've already built these silos and maybe we're trying to protect our turf. <laughs> I, I think the... It's help. I mean, because I start to worry about inattentive ADHD because you read that people with inattentive could have OCD, they could have bipolar, they could have some autism. We don't have the language to describe all of this except to say you've got some of this and you've got some of that, and we're going to help you with this medicine and we're going to help you with those sessions. Yeah. So it's almost like an individual plan because we recognize that you have certain behaviors that we have called this disorder. Yep. I couldn't agree more. And I totally forgot to mention learning disorders, right? Like, right. What, 40 yes. to 60 percent? Yeah. I, I honestly, I don't think I've met anyone with ADHD that doesn't struggle with, you know, some co comorbidity, right? Yeah. And learning right. disorders is a huge one. So, or mm -hmm. I like to say learning differences, although I just had Barbara Arrowwood Smith on. Arrowwood, Arrow, Barbara Arrowsmith. Oh my God, me and my, me and my problem with names. Anyway, she's just so brilliant, and just listening to her comments about, for example, you have, and here I go off track. For example, you have dyslexia, and mm -hmm. so your child gets diagnosed with dyslexia, and I'm like, okay, my son's been diagnosed with dyslexia, but he's a really awesome writer. He gets the information. He tries to get it in ways where he doesn't have to do tons of reading, but he can read. He can totally read. And he's, you know, he was like at the top of his class for reading when he was, you know, uh, little, right? 
So he was yeah. never flagged for dyslexia. And her comment was, yeah, but there's six different ways. And I'm saying this incorrectly. You have to go back and listen to that episode. I'm saying it probably incorrectly, but what she was trying to say is underneath this dyslexia label are all different parts of the brain that are being affected. So which one is it? And so if you don't know, you can't really do anything about the dyslexia, right? Because he's not a traditional kid with dyslexia. He can totally read, but he's been diagnosed with it. And so you get a little bit of dyslexia, you get a little bit of anxiety, you get a little bit of ADHD, maybe a little bit of OCD because <laughs> it's all spectral and you get a big mess, right? I mean, it's, it's much more difficult to navigate life or I should say navigate the school system, especially. So I find this all so fascinating. Well, I think the labels or the t the names can be helpful as a starting point, mm -hmm. but I think people have to realize they're not absolutes. Yeah. Because that's what I was saying when I read the symptoms about me. You know, you thought that you had to check off five of them or you didn't have the condition. And now Dr. Brady years ago wrote shadow syndrome saying that they're finding even people that have two of the symptoms can be helped. And Dr. Farone's recent research is showing the same thing. So we're excluding people that might not have the full condition. But like Kathleen Nadeau was saying, when we talk about depression, people can say I'm depressed, but that doesn't mean they have clinical depression. So people can have some symptoms of ADHD, but they don't warrant the diagnosis or they don't warrant treatment interventions. Or maybe even with a small amount, they do. I, it, it's, it's very complicated and we haven't achieved a level of insight yet. Yeah. I love having this conversation. So I am curious, are the symptoms of inattentive ADHD in kids the same as the symptoms in adults? And are they different in men versus women if they are the same? Well, I can answer that, is it the same in men and women? Because when I first started the organization and I wanted it to be about men and women because I had heard boys and girls both have inattentive type, but it seemed like if we talked about inattentive type, we're only talking about the females. So I worked to find men that had inattentive ADHD, and I interviewed 24 of them. And their stories were very, very similar to what a woman's story would be. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, Ellen Littman had created a list of like comorbid feelings that women would have, the anxiety, the depression, the, um, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember all the things. But when I went back and asked the men, this is all on my website under an article about 24 men that I interviewed within a 10 of ADHD, but their profile and the emotions they had, the feelings of rejection, the, the shame, the anger, depression. Yeah. All the same as the women. So I think to me, the fact of not getting diagnosed contributes to a lot of these problems and people will say, Having ADHD isn't the problem. Not knowing I had it was the problem. You know, as I was reading your book, Cynthia, I've thought about this before, but it really hit home. I had a boyfriend in college. We went out for probably six years. And you know how ADHD attracts ADHD. But of course, I didn't know then that I had ADHD. Right. But he was really smart. He was um, studying physics. He's a physicist, but he didn't think he was smart and he was extremely hard on himself. He was in his head a lot. I realize now he was depressed. And the, the other thing is that he was really into bodybuilding and I believe he had body dysmorphia because he always was like, I'm fat. And I'm like, you're, you're big, but you're not fat. You're, you know, you're full of muscle. That's not fat. Uh -huh. um, and I know that that, you know, with with boys and ADHD and men with ADHD, that can definitely um, be a problem. And then as an adult, he struggled with keeping a job. And I suspect that because, you know, that's because he's done work that he's not really passionate about versus uh -huh. 
when he did well, he was doing work that he was really passionate about. And I, you know, as I'm reading your book, I'm like, yeah, I'm convinced. I, I think he had an att- or has an attentive ADHD. And we just, we had no idea that this is something that, you know, well, even at that time, adults had, but certainly not that men had. Well, and so that's part of what I do sometimes is I'll think back to my high school class and think of who else might have had ADHD because those are the people you know the best are the ones you went to school with. But I wanted to mention that there's a men's ADHD support group. It's a new nonprofit, and they have a Facebook group that has over 7,000 participants It grew phenomenally during COVID, and their primary focus is to helping these men who say they really experience rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Mm -hmm. And who would think that men had that, you know, that they're... Well, with toxic masculinity, right? They would never admit they had it. Right. And so that's what they're trying to help these men realize that this is a safe place to experience, to share those feelings, to learn to overcome them, to learn to deal with it, and to accept yourself as someone with ADHD. So I just wanted to get that out there for women who might have a man in their life who is suffering from ADHD. You know, I really appreciate that because I get messages literally, you know, all the time asking, is there a counterpart to what we do for men? And I never know where to where to refer them to. So would you do me a favor when we're done? Would you send me the link so I can include it in the show notes? Yeah. Yeah. And I I'll explore whether there are any podcasts like yours that are geared for men only. That would be great. And if there aren't, someone should start one. Ha <laughs> ha. So, you know, what What I just thought about, too, is I'm going back to my boyfriend um, in college and law school. I just remember he told me that his uncle got into a bunch of trouble. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but I am convinced that he had ADHD because he was just kind of like, I think, a crazy man. And yeah. so, you know... Maybe his father didn't have it, but his uncle probably had ADHD. And then, you know, his version was the inattentive versus, you know, hyperactive or combined. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Right. This is fascinating. So, Cynthia, what are the ADHD traits that you feel are responsible for your success? I guess um, the risk-taking creative ideas, having a lot of energy when I'm involved in my passion. And the other thing I was thinking, uh, because of writing a book, Mm -hmm. sometimes people with conversationally, we might throw in the whole kitchen sink, we might overshare. But when you're writing a book, oversharing is a good thing. (laughs) People, people want to know They want to know you personally. They want to know you honestly. And so I was thinking that's a trait of people with ADD. If they become a writer and they overshare, that's a good thing. I think a lot of writers have ADHD. Uh Uh-huh. Right? I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, I don't, I know I wouldn't have written a book if it hadn't been for COVID. So there is a group of women writers with ADHD, and they're always asking each other, how do, how do they do it? Yeah, yeah. So what do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is? The, I, the other day, this woman had written an article called The Tetris Calendar. And I don't know if you know the game of Tetris, but it's where these blocks come down from the sky and you try to manipulate them to fit them in. So you're building this wall before more blocks come down and you can't fit them in. And she she gave this image of like the person with ADD creates a Tetris calendar where every single space is full. And then when something goes wrong, their whole calendar falls apart. Mm -hmm. because they did it too tightly. And I can see that my husband doesn't have ADD, but it's a constant frustration for me that he says, 
I'm going to the gym and I'll be home in an hour. <laughs> and I know he'll be home in two hours. But he, he doesn't think that way. And he puts more stuff on than he could possibly do in the time allowed. So I guess I, there used to be this uh, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. And, yes. and as I don't have three children, as I ha- don't have commitment, my life is so simple and has such routines to it that as much as someone with ADD can do that, that is very, very helpful. You have fewer things to have to think about, fewer balls in the air that you have to manage, and that is healthy for your brain. We need structure, right? We balk against it, but that is what we need. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm I'm curious, like, if your husband maybe is on the ADHD spectrum, because my husband, if he says, I'll be gone in an hour, He'll be back in 55 minutes. It drives uh-huh. me nuts. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, that's hard to say. I mean, he would never take medication. Right. Uh, he, he's, it's almost like a self-determining thing. Do you think uh, you're having problems in your life that you want help with? Or do you, do you think I'm doing fine and I don't need help? Yeah. Well, you talked about that. You mentioned a doctor, I think, a couple of times in your book, I can't remember who it was, who basically said that in his experience, if you think you have ADHD, yes, you likely do. Dr. Phelan said that. And that that is um, what the message is often to women is that they will go see someone who will be who will tell them, no, you don't have ADHD. And so I tell them, you need to be firmly convinced. And we have a questionnaire on our website that helps adults with ADHD, uh, you know, get to that point where they go and they are firmly convinced. And now in England, they're, um, they're saying how people are easily getting diagnosed. But someone else is saying, you don't go for a diagnosis unless you feel something's wrong. You don't want to spend the money. You don't want to spend the time. You're not doing it for a lark. You have a a life that's hurting you and you want to explore change. So. Absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. Why would someone want to make their life more difficult, right? Well, I guess people say you get a diagnosis, you're trying to get the easy way out. But those people don't understand. And that's what I'm hoping my book will show is that there's so much more than that shows on the surface. And if people are out there masking, you're not getting a true concept of their life. Yeah, no, absolutely not. So, Cynthia, do you have a number one ADHD workaround other than simplifying everything? (laughs) <laughs> well, I, the thing that helped me the most is stopping negative talk. The other day, we had um, I was doing the interview with the video with Catherine Ellison. We got this psychiatrist to come on. You know, he has inattentive ADD. It was a wonderful interview, and I didn't push the record button. Oh, geez, I've done that. <laughs> I've done that. Okay. Okay, so I don't know if you beat yourself up, but I don't. Yeah. I just said, and so my husband said, looked to me, said, I can't believe how calmly you're taking that. And what I said off the spur of the moment, I said, because I made so many mistakes in my life, I know how to deal with it. Yeah. But I don't want to keep beating myself up when I make something. And so the other day when I was talking to this psychiatrist again, I said, I have something to tell you that I hope you'll have forbearance for, (laughs) you know, and what Terry Matlin said, which I agree with, is you need to work to get people in your life who can accept that about you. Yes. You know, accept that maybe you have a messy house, but that you're a good artist or accepting that you have a sense of humor, but you didn't put the best meal on the table. We all have different strengths and different weaknesses. I like that concept of of people that are neurodivergent are more spiky. You know, we have more really outstanding traits and maybe more troublesome, trouble, problem. I can't think of the word, but anyway. Maybe some more troublesome traits? Yeah. Yeah. 
I love that. I'd say the no negative talk, my exercising, and now I'm trying to work on meditation. Ah, I love it. So, Cynthia, where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? Well, our website is very simple. I for inattentive, ADHD.org. And the my book and my information about me as an author is in that website under living with inattentive ADHD. So if you see the top menu, that's where you could learn more about me. But the IADHD.org is about it's this only website that's solely about inattentive ADHD. We have a questionnaire there for uh, parents to figure out if their children, child might have inattentive ADHD. We have a questionnaire for adults to figure out if they have inattentive. And as I said earlier, we have that article about 24 men with inattentive ADHD. And that those would all be under the ADHD info aspect Wonderful. of the menu, the menu. Wonderful. And so if they want to pre-order the book, is it best for them to go to your website? There are links there. Do they go to Amazon? What should they do? We have a link at our website, but it doesn't really make any difference. You can go to Amazon. It's in Canada or it's in the UK. It's in Australia. Any place uh, you can go to your local bookstore and order it. That's wonderful. And it's called and, Living with Inattentive ADHD. Right. And just know that if you order it and um, you're helping us to create awareness about ADD just by buying the book. Yes. So go buy the book. I'm <laughs> going to buy many copies of the book, Cynthia. Oh, all right. And, and always reviews are helpful. Positive reviews. Yes. Cynthia, thank you so much for spending time with us here today to talk about inattentive ADHD. Again, you are such a wonderful role model, not only for ADHD, but also for this idea that we have to live a life of meaning. We feel called to make a difference. And we are late bloomers. So if you feel like you're meant to do mm. something special, keep at it because you're right. It's exactly what we do, right? <laughs> yes. Thank you. That was a fun time together. Oh, you're a delight. So that's what I have for you for this week. Before I go, don't forget to check out my live coaching program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. -okay. There is also a private community with women just like you. And you can find out more information at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-OK. -okay. If you sign up now with the code podcast SASS, S-A-S-S, -S, you'll get $500 off just for being a podcast listener. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.